Hello and welcome to Analysis. I'm Jeremy Corbyn, Member of the British Parliament and very interested in this discussion we're having today. Friday the 13th of September marked the 20th anniversary of the Oslo Peace Accords, a historic moment in international diplomacy when many thought that the long-running Israel-Palestinian conflict could move away from the streets and the battlefield and finally be resolved through negotiations and compromise. But it was always controversial among many Palestinians who felt that they were being sold short by the Israelis and by the international community. First, here's Flaminia Gimbaldo with a short piece for us. Friday marked the 20th anniversary of the Oslo Peace Accords. On the occasion, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO Chair Yasser Arafat shook hands on the White House lawn, signing an agreement that established the Palestinian Authority and a framework for negotiation that has lasted to this day. The children of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, have embarked together on a bold journey. Together, today, with all our hearts and all our souls, we bid them shalom, salam, peace. The principles of the Accords were modeled around Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, which were stipulated in 1967 following the Six-Day War. These emphasize the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and require the withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. In the spirit of those principles, both leaders signed letters of mutual recognition. The Israeli government recognized the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, while the PLO recognized the right of the State of Israel to exist and renounced to all forms of armed struggle, including the right to armed defense. In 1994, Yasser Arafat, Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres shared the Nobel Peace Prize. Meanwhile, Israel continued to build and expand settlements in Gaza and the West Bank, and Palestinian retaliation culminated in the Second Intifada. According to statistics by the Middle East Monitor, the number of Palestinians who were killed by the Israeli occupation since Oslo is more than 7,000. Around 12,000 Palestinian homes have been demolished in the occupied territories. Settler numbers and lands conquered in the 1967 Middle East War have more than doubled to over half a million. Moreover, Israel has kept control of more than 60% of the occupied West Bank and around 80% of Palestinian water resources. The further fragmentation of the West Bank, the isolation of the Gaza Strip and Israel's absorption of East Jerusalem mean that many people on both sides of the divide no longer think a two-state solution is viable. UN recognition of Palestine as a non-member observer state in 2012 was seen by many as an important step towards achieving independence, although Israel has not yet accepted pre-1967 lines as a basis for negotiation. In July this year, peace talks resumed after a three-year impasse. The following week, Israel announced the building of 900 new settlements in the West Bank and infringed the peace process by carrying out a military raid in the West Bank, which killed three Palestinians, including a UN worker. Talks are scheduled to run until next May, with little expectations that they will reach the finish line. Flaminia Giambalvo, Islam Channel. It should also be noted that today also marks 31 years since the slaughter of as many as 3,500 Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in Lebanon by Christian militias allied to Israel. The massacre was one of the first events to really bring the plight of the Palestinians to the world's attention and perhaps helped to lay the groundwork for the Oslo Accords. The memories of this incident burn strong in the minds of Palestinians. To discuss all this and more, we have with us Nassim Ahmed, Senior Researcher at the Palestine Return Centre, Abi Haim, Chair of Architects and Planners for Justice in Palestine, and by phone we have Mustafa Baghouti, former presidential candidate for the Palestinian National Authority and Secretary General of the Palestinian National Initiative. Thank you very much for joining us today on this programme. Uh, if we could start first with you, Mustafa. 20 years on since Oslo, is there really a prospect for peace? And is the Oslo-type initiative the groundwork for a future peace settlement? Or do we need to look for something very different? I believe that uh, this is a very good question, and it leads to asking whether this agreement has brought us closer to peace and to two-state solution or not. 
And uh, the whole concept of Oslo was based on the uh, paradigm of uh, a compromise of two states. And the uh, Palestinians uh, gave up their uh, old uh, demand of one democratic state in the whole of Palestine in exchange for this little tiny state in 22% of Palestinian land. And uh, hoped that Oslo agreement would lead to the creation of that state. Unfortunately, after 20 years, we are much further away from the possibility of peace and state than we were when the agreement was signed. One main reason for that is that the agreement had so many flaws. Uh, one main cause is that Israel never implemented uh, that agreement uh, fully, it just implemented what it did and uh, what uh, they considered is in their interest. But the main factor was that the Palestinians made the huge mistake of signing an agreement without demanding first the freeze of all settlement activities. So in a way, with the allowing the settlement to continue, which led to the cre increasing the number of the settlers from 160,000 to 650,000 today, allowing settlements to continue to be built was like uh, a situation when you are treating a patient and he's bleeding, and instead of stopping the bleeding first, you start uh, looking at other uh, parts of the body and forget about the bleeding, which continues till the patient dies. In my opinion, this is exactly what is happening. And unfortunately, the most recent uh, round of negotiations is repeating yet the same, same mistake. Israel has uh, managed to impose its own vision, which is uh, talk while you grab the land, talk while you change reality on the ground. Precisely, practically, Israel uses the negotiations as uh, an instrument to cover up its uh, settlement activities, and the de facto assassination of the possibility of two-state solution. Uh, Mustafa, th thanks very much for that sort of opening <coughs> point, really. Abe, if I can go over to you. From the point Mustafa was making, that the settlements have grown, the uh, theft of land, if you like, has grown, is there a possibility for peace on any kind of Oslo model, or do we have to look for something totally different? Well, I mean, from what we've seen and experienced over the last 20 years, it is very obvious that Oslo was a big con, you know, for the Palestinians. It was a totally unequal situation for the oppressor and the oppressed. And even though uh, Yasser Arafat recognized Israel's right to exist and their right to uh, peace and security and giving up, you know, terrorism, there was nothing that the Israelis offered to the Palestinians other than recognition that the Palestinians, the PLO would be the representation of the Palestinians, and also that um, they would enter peace talks. There was very little further. And ever since then, it, it was actually described by Edward Said as a Palestinian surrender, complete capitulation. And um, ever since then, it, Israel has recognized nothing it has just gone on with its basic agenda, which was the total colonization of the West Bank, and uh, has just gone on building settlement after settlement, taking over Palestinian houses, demolishing Palestinian uh, homes, and disregarding international law completely, because even though it was recognized that 242 uh, and the 1967 borders would be the basis of the uh, uh, negotiation. Israel has completely disregarded that and has uh, disregarded the key element, which was nothing should be done that would uh, uh, change the status of the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem. And it's completely negated any international law or you know actual principle of the Oslo agreements. Thanks for that. Nazim, I've been at two conferences with you over the past couple of weeks in commemoration, if that's the right word, of Oslo 20 years on. Do you believe that those around the table at the moment in Washington or in Jerusalem or wherever it is they happen to be meeting are actually seriously in negotiation or is this some big diplomatic game that the West play whenever there's a problem somewhere else? Well, I think the consensus among most commentators is that it is actually a big game. and. Uh, 
the the problem with Oslo, as most commenters will say, is that uh, is it really uh, is is the failure within the structure itself, or is the failure a failure to implement the plans of Oslo? And the unanimous consensus you'll get with most commentators is that there's a failure within the structure. Most of them mentioned some of the structures, and uh, Abe also mentioned a few. And uh, it was never really a, an instrument to implement international law or an instrument of decolonization. It was more an instrument to actually uh, shift the basis upon which Israel carries out its occupation and colonization of Palestine. That's what you'll hear from most commentators around the world. And, uh, and, and, and one example of that is, um, is, of course, the fact that the Oslo Agreement bypassed the, the largest constitu constituency of the Palestinians, which is the refugees. They represent 70% 70, 70 of the Palestinian population. And here you have a, a, a setup, a mechanism of ne negotiation between two parties, which completely bypasses 70% of the Palestinian population and their human rights. So it was obviously structurally flawed. You cannot have any kind of consensus by marginalizing the majority. So uh, I think after 20 years, I don't think there is any real debate. and. Uh, the problem with Oslo now has become a an ongoing process. Its its um, interimness of the Oslo is itself a, uh, is is a failure. Is is a problem. It was supposed to the final status negotiation was supposed to begin after five years. It's now twenty years, and uh, and facts are such on the ground that there is no hope that the uh, uh, the, the the agreements will actually be implemented. Uh, the way even to actually allow is to have a two-state solution, which it really is a compromise by the Palestinians themselves. Uh, so even under the terms of Oslo, Oslo's failed, but under the broader terms of the Palestinian struggle, I think it's been a total failure. So uh, on both accounts, it's failed, I think. Mustafa, we're discussing this here, the three of us, from the luxury of a studio in London. You're in Ramallah, where life is very, very different. We're hearing very little of popular opinion from Palestinians on the West Bank, certainly very little from anyone in Gaza, and nothing at all from the voices of those in the refugee camps. What are the feelings, in your view, of ordinary Palestinians in those places, and indeed within the 1948 borders of Israel, about the talks at the moment? I think you know very well that the vast majority of Palestinian groups, uh, practically all the groups without exception, uh, except Fatah, uh, have refused these negotiations and refused the repetition of the same dilemma and mistake that was done in Oslo. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Palestinian refugees in the diaspora and uh, in other places of the world feel alienated. Uh, one of the biggest uh, mistakes of Oslo was that it left many Palestinians in the diaspora alienated from the whole process. Uh, and because uh, the agreement related only to part of the Palestinian population, a very small a minority, back to, uh, uh, and not to the whole Palestinian population. So I think there is a feeling of uh, anger mixed with uh, unhappiness and disagreement uh, with these new rounds of negotiation. Mainly because people uh, believe that we've been there, we've seen this before. Uh, and uh, you know what? People don't think this will make a difference or uh, it matters much. Uh, I think this is the, over the overwhelming feeling. On the other hand, there is a lot, especially now at the 20th anniversary of Oslo, a lot of discussions about the alternative strategy. And you hear very important voices about the value and importance of enhancing popular nonviolence, about the need to regain Palestinian unity and internal democracy. Mr. On that about point... To uh, the whole concept of two-state solution, maybe. Yeah. Many voices are speaking now about one-state option. So on, there is a lot of interesting discussion going on. On that point, 20 years on, are people discussing the role that the PLO and Fatah played in the, on the Oslo negotiations and the current exclusion of the government of Gaza from it and, by implication, quite a lot of um, Palestinian refugees would not necessarily feel represented at the current negotiating tables? You talk of a different solution of one state. Take us through how that would come about. Then I'll put that to Abe and Nazim to see if they think uh, this is a credible way forward. Do you want me to answer? Yes, that? please, please, Mustafa. Yes. Okay. okay. 
Well, listen, uh, first of all, there are two issues here. One issue is the lack of representation of Palestinians at the table of negotiations, of course. Uh, there is a limited number of people who are engaging in this process, and uh, even many leaders in Fatah don't know what's going on. It's just uh, a common knowledge. Uh, so, yes, there is an exclusion of everybody from that process which is kept, uh, kept secret and discreet. And that is not very promising considering the previous experience of Oslo. On the other hand, I have an opinion about the issue of Gaza. Uh, I believe that, uh, in a way, uh, separating Gaza from tank is one of the main goals of the Israeli policy, because this is their way of the option of two-state solution. But also, it's their way of uh, nullifying or reducing the effect of the demographic factor by getting rid of uh, very little part of Palestine, 1.3 percent, which is Gaza. They managed. They think they got rid of about 30 percent or 35 percent of the demographic formula. Yet in Gaza itself, I think uh, what uh, happened after the internal division, unfortunately was the creation of another government there. And gradually that other government became sort of hostage to Oslo, like the government in the West Bank as well. In the same way, this whole co-emphasis and concern on self-ruling and on the government, the so-called government structure and the authority structures, whether in West Bank and Gaza, while we are all under occupation, and when the whole West Bank and Gaza look nothing but clusters of Pantosans, in my opinion, was a repetition of the mistake, but in a different way. And that's why we need to uh, less emphasis now on the issue of the authority and who's governing uh, this authority and who's a minister in it while we're all under occupation. And what we need is more than ministers. We need leadership. We need a unified leadership that could lead the Palestinian struggle and revitalize the national liberation movement and revitalize the connections between all Palestinians, because the Palestinian cause is not concerning only the people in Gaza or West Bank or Jerusalem. It concerns the whole Palestinian population. Mm. Hey, the points Mustafa was making there about representation are clearly essential to the whole thing. Do you feel a sense that the uh, Palestinian communities are being dissected by all this mm. into West Bank, Gaza, refugees, Israel borders, diaspora all around the world. I mean, do you feel this is engendering a sense of unity or the opposite? No, well, the whole point is th this is another agenda. It's the total fragmentation of the Palestinian community, especially, you know, the exile, you know, the diaspora Palestinians who don't have a say at all. It looks like it's just the PA, you know, that is actually negotiating on its own behalf. And, of course, the division of Gaza from the West Bank, which, in fact, under Oslo was meant to have a, a link, you know, a very positive link. Israel has very cleverly sieged it off, uh, created a, a sort of a, an imprisoned enclave in Gaza and an imprisoned enclave in, in the West Bank. And again, contrary to the Oslo Accords, which was meant to have free movement of people, goods, and vehicles. So Israel has created an impossible, an impossible, very surreal situation, which eventually must implode. And it is the people in the end who are now pushing, you know, the PA. They are the ones that are resisting. They are resisting within Israel, the Palestinians within Israel, trying to go back to some of the, the villages, you know, that they were dispersed from. And so the whole issue is out in the open now. You know, the fragmentation has created a situation mm -hmm. where one has to look for other um, alternatives to the, two, the paradigm of the two-state solution, mm -hmm. which is completely um, I sort of impossible, really. I was an observer at the last presidential election in Palestine. I've been in both Gaza and the West Bank and the camps many, many times since then. It seems an awful long time ago. Nazim, is there a question here of legitimacy of those that are undertaking the negotiations? That's been one of the major bugbears of the whole Oslo process. It's deemed to be illegitimate. And um, 
part of that, of course, is because the Palestinians in diaspora has been have been marginalised, they, they, and there is talks within the Palestinian communities of revitalising the PNC and having new elections. So the Palestinians in the diaspora can re-engage. One of the reasons why the Palestinians are divided politically and geographically within Palestine itself, uh, you have Gaza in one place, and of course the West Bank, is because the Palestinians in the diaspora are not part of the are not players within the whole Palestinian issue. They've been, as we're talking about, a massive num cohort of people, millions of people. Yeah. So because they don't have a voice within the Palestinian say, uh, Israel, I think, has found it easier to divide the Palestinians within his, mm. within historic Palestine. And now, if the uh, Palestinians in diaspora were allowed a way into the negotiation, into the process itself, I think it would give it a lot more legitimacy. And there is talks within the Palestinian communities and leadership to actually revive the Palestinian National Council and have new elections on this issue. Uh, Mustafa, I'm conscious of the representation issues and the election issues, but also of the lack of any direct part by the refugees and the diaspora. And diaspora are increasingly a very political and very important force all over Latin America and the rest of the world where they're making their voices heard. Don't you think there's a time for some mechanism that every Palestinian can have a voice in what is happening to the future of the Palestinian movements? You know, the reality is that not only the Palestinians in the diaspora don't have representation, but also inside as well. The last the uh, presidential elections took place in 2005. The last uh, parliamentary elections took place in 2006. Uh, Palestinian National Council did not have any real elections since ages, maybe never, actually. So the only way to get over this, and that was what was a major component of our national unity agreement, was that there should be elections for the Palestinian National Council in which all Palestinians should participate, including those in the diaspora. But of course, that did never materialize, and I don't see it materializing unless there is a so strong movement from Palestinian people demanding their right of electing their representatives. The people in the diaspora criticize a lot, but I blame them for one thing. Is, and I'm sorry to say that, but I have to be honest and say it. They really never organized a movement to demand their rights. There are many people who represent Palestinians in UK or in the United States or in Qatar or Bahrain or Jordan uh, who were chosen by the leadership. But these people were never elected. And I would still like to see a movement among Palestinians in at least one or two of these countries, taking the, building an example of demanding their right to elect their representative. Actually, there is nothing wrong with them going ahead and electing their representative mm -hmm. and saying this is the person that would represent Most, us. Most of all, that's a really good note on which to move into the break so we can think about this question of how there can be a genuine voice for all Palestinians. And I think you've thrown out a challenge there to the Palestinian diaspora, the need to organise in whichever country they happen to be in order to promote the interests of Palestinian people to make sure they're properly represented at all levels. We're going to take a short break now and then we'll come back for the rest of what is, I think, an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you.